Welcome to this week's episode of the People of Fishing Podcast. It's Chris Kingery here with Miles Berghoff, a good friend of mine that I've uh, I've traveled with over the years, learned a lot from. Miles has got a really cool story. And without, you know, knowing Miles as a person, knowing uh, what it takes to to get to a professional bass fishing standpoint, I would say just on paper uh, Miles is probably the mold for people that are the hardest working type of people in the industry. And it, it really is a testament of how hard you have to work to get there. Um, and, you know, everybody thinks everything's handed to them. And one of the biggest things I've noticed is, is Miles is one of the guys that started from the bottom with no help and kind of made his way. And, uh, so I really want to thank him for coming by today. Thanks miles. Thank you, man. You're making me blush right now. Oh man. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we traveled for a couple years on the opens. Luckily yeah, somehow right. I met you in a Walmart parking lot. I know. I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly how it ended up happening, but it, it worked out perfect. Yeah. So I, uh, we had just opened our store and, uh, we just, we saw Fitzgerald rods. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trevor's a good friend of mine. And I happened to be on the phone with him. We talk every now and then. And I was on my way to Walmart and I said, man, one of your guys is here at Walmart. And you had the, uh, the truck and it was all wrapped and everything had a Fitzgerald rod sticker on it. Oh, um, yeah. You were, I think you were in transition from moving from California right. to Tennessee. Yeah. And well, actually I was going to move back to here to Florida. Um, and because my wife's uh, she was, she was, she became a dental hygienist and so it was like the last year before she got her certification and, and I decided to move back to Florida ahead of her. And, uh, then I was here for like eight months or something like that. And then we found out that her, her, her certification didn't transfer to Florida. So we had to like pivot and move to Tennessee. Right. But yeah, I was living down here at the time. Yeah. And, uh, I think you were on your way to go fish. I, I remember re weird details like yep. this, but you're, <laughs> you remember more than I do. You, uh, you were on your way to fish some charity tournament in Kissimmee. Mm -hmm. And, um, no, I think it was a Swanee river or was it Kissimmee? I think it was Kissimmee cause you were heading past our shop to go to Orlando. Okay. Head towards Orlando. Okay, okay. And cause I, I happened to be on the phone with Trevor and he's like, Oh, he's like, I don't know what he's doing here. And, and Trevor had a joke calling you a gypsy because he, he said at one point he was like in Yankee town, in Yankee town fishing. And here you come down a dirt road in the middle of Yankee town. Um, he's like, you never know where that guy's going to show up. He's like, go say hi, whatever. And you just happened to be walking out of Walmart as I was getting back in my truck. And uh, I stopped and you're like, Oh, you know, uh, are you on the team or this? And I said, no, we've just opened a store right down the road here. We'd love to have you by. And you ended up stopping on the way out of town. Mm-hmm. And then we got talking about the opens and whatever else. And then somehow along the way, I get a phone call from you a couple of weeks later and say, Hey, do you know anybody going up to Smith Lake? Oh, that's right. And that you, you had one. your boat um, because you were in the, in the process, you were in the process of moving. And um, when you're trying to find a way for your boat to get to Smith Lake, cause you weren't going to make it back to Florida in time to, to go to Smith. Oh, that's right. You drove my boat up there. Yes. Yeah. Oh. And you're like, do you know anybody that can bring my boat up? I said, I'm fishing as a co-angler. And uh, you're like, man, would you be able to bring my boat up? And I'm like, kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, I'm like just a co-angler and whatever. And some guy's asking me to bring his boat. Got a TV show and all that stuff. And so you're a little starstruck for a second. But um, so we, uh, we were going to do that. But then the hurricane hit. Oh, that's right. And you ahead of time. And you're like, do you know anybody that can evacuate my boat? And I said, you could just <laughs> put it in my garage because my boat's out of the garage. For I, re a bit. I remember that yeah. very clearly because <laughs> like in, in tournament fishing, you're constantly trying to like pivot and figure out solutions to like little logistical problems. Yep. And like that one. And so remembering that you brought the, the boat up to, to Smith did not register with me, but the, the hurricane yeah. did because I was like, all right, that one is. You yeah. Know, that, so that's I kept important. I kept it in the garage, um, and uh, we we ended up going to Smith Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, got to Smith Lake, drove just fine the whole way up to Smith Lake. And there were some deer. There were some deer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we get five minutes from the ramp at, at five o'clock or five thirty in the morning, whatever it was, and 
oh, I could see the sign for the ramp and five deer run across the road. I'm like, oh my God, don't let me drive 500 miles and then, you know, encounter a deer. Hey Amen. But what I will say on that is if you do have to hit a deer with a boat behind you, just, just hit it straight on. Yeah. Cause it's all about comprehensive insurance takes care of that. That's one thing <laughs> I learned. Yeah. I would, I, I'm glad that you, you made it okay. The boat, you know, it was temporary, but I'm glad that you didn't, you know, yeah. try to do evasive actions to, to oh, miss them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, that, and then you're like, you know, if you want, come practice with me, whatever else. And it wasn't like a sure thing at right. that point, but you know, I, I, we kind of fished pretty good together and we did. whatnot and, uh, and, and had some productive days. So then I was going to go as a boater the next mm-hmm. year and we went to dinner the night after the tournament and you're like, Cut, you sure you don't want to link next year <laughs> <laughs> and then next you know we travel for a couple of years but um that was that was a good two schedules or so we fished too it was really good i actually smith actually uh uh you know rem- it that whole situation at smith was was really really cool you bringing the boat up but i think we fished really really well together as far as practicing for that event i remember uh fishing for spots and and for some reason i was like really confident and fishing for spots out deep. You know? Oh, like Those Norman school. Or- oh no. On Smith. No, Smith, Smith. Smith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. We were fishing. Yeah. We were fishing for spots in that one. Of course. I mean, I'm a large mouth guy and mm-hmm. you're a large mouth guy. So I, I, I remember we did a little bit of that, but we also did a lot of, of good offshore fishing. You yeah. Know? I think we threw a spy bait a little bit and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I had the spy bait out cause somebody had told me that I, I think that was the first bait. time that I, th- I was, th- I ever threw the spy, spy bait mm-hmm. and you, I think you got me keyed in on that. Yeah. Yeah. But you saved my tournament because we, we pulled up to school mm-hmm. and you were throwing a spook and they blew it out of the water and wouldn't come back up. And then for whatever reason you had, just a little jigging spoon with a little Acme cast master jigging oh, spoon right, yeah. and started picking them off. Yeah. And my, my boater who I'm friends with today, he actually mm-hmm. travels with us now. Uh, mm-hmm. Kenny Sammons. Um, I drew him the first day and, or no second day. I drew Brian Latimer the first day. Oh, um, that was a heck of a draw. Um, that was a fun day. Fun day. I bet, I you bet. can't have a bad day when you're fishing with that, that would guy. Be that. Um, and so we uh the second day though that spoon came into play yeah um because i think it was no you know what it was the first day that we fished with him because he went out the second day of the tournament and he bought a bunch of spoons because i whooped his butt did no 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 no. uh i fished with brian the second day okay okay um i fished with uh uh uh, you know what i'm getting norman confused with smith different tournament i I (laughs) fished I fish with Brian on Norman. Together. It does spotted bass. All I remember at Smith no. was a spy bait. Yep, fishing deep. Yep. School. No, I fished with uh, Kenny Sammons uh, the first day, mm. and he was dragging a jig on some points and some rocks and logs and stuff like that. Yeah. And we ended up finding out like they'd come up schooling, and I'd throw that spoon over there mm. and pick one off of the school, and then go back down. And he'd turn the boat and try to like throw a spook on him and then wouldn't get bit and go back the other way. And they'd come up and I'd throw a spoon on and catch another one out of the school. And he was like losing his crap over it. The end of the day, I I had a limit. It was an all right limit, but he, uh, he ends up, um, calling me. He's like, where'd you get those spoons? And he went to Walmart and bought every spoon off the wall because of that. It it was, you know, it was one of those things that, that just kind of made sense at the time, because I mean, if, if you can't get them there, you only have this really narrow window of opportunity. If they're on the surface eating, they come up like once every 20 minutes too. And if you can, if you miss that window, like you might as well not throw the top water, Mm -hmm. you know, if they're only coming up for a short period, you know, maybe two or three pops, you, you're better off throwing a heavy spoon like that that gets through that water column really quick, and those spots will eat it. Like yeah. Crazy. So leading up to that, though, um, I, you know, I never thought about any of the, you know, any any other way of meeting you or whatnot. It was just it happened that way, whatever, right. you know. And then I, you know, found out about your history, and the the history is what really interests me as you as a person more than yeah. anything. Um, because, you know, 
you and I'll let you tell the whole story, but right. um, you went to U- UCF? UCF, yeah, for um, college. I actually went to a community college down in Fort Pierce. Uh, that It was called uh, Indian River Community College. Now mm-hmm. I think it's Indian R- River College. It's no longer a community college. Right. Um, but started there and then went up to UCF. Now, did you start fishing at a younger age or did you kind of start fishing as you got into college? Oh yeah. Well, I was, so I was born down in, uh, St. Pete and Mm -hmm. we lived down in the the Keys. So I lived in marathon and so I was surrounded by water. I mean, there's no other way for me to, to go than to, to go fishing, you know, that, so that was my first love was the water. And then, you know, going fishing with my dad, going for, you know, Wahoo, Dorado, anything that'll bite, you know? And, uh, so I fell in love with fishing then, but then we've also got a place in Connecticut we'd go to during the summertime and there's, you know, it's got this beautiful population of smallmouth. Um, and then, uh, they ended up, you know, uh, stocking largemouth later on, but the smallmouth, my first bass that I remember was a three and a half pound smallmouth. Eh, I'm assuming it was three and a half pounds. It looked like a 10 pounder to me as a kid. But something around that three pound range hit this little uh it was a hard bait that you cast it out it pulls a string and then the the legs it's a frog that cla- <laughs> claps together that was my first that was my first bass that i remember and ever since then i was hooked on bass fishing nice nice yeah so what um when did you start tournament fishing so I fished my first tournament down in California. So we lived, I grew up in California. I was born in Florida and, and grew up, you know, you know, kinder or preschool years down in the Keys. Uh, but then we uh, soon moved back to, to California, Paradise, California, um, and, uh, and ended up fishing a little bit there, you know, little ponds and stuff like that. But then I picked up a magazine of Bass West, Um, and, uh, and then I'm like, man, guys do this, you know, competitively, they do it for a living. And, uh, so I ended up joining a bass club and, uh, this, this guy named Vic ended up letting me fish with them, uh, in one of the club tournaments. I caught two of the five fish we caught, uh, we, we Mm -hmm. weighed in, got a check my very first tournament. And ever since then, you know, I was, I was hooked, but really during high school, if we're honest, I didn't really fish that many tournaments. I maybe fished, you know, all the way through high school, probably six or seven tournaments, you know, club events. Um, but I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I was laying the foundation, you know, in my mind, uh, as I was going to high school, I just wasn't teed up to, I didn't have a boat at the time and, and things like that. And so, uh, you know, I just was preparing myself for that and just kind of psyching myself up to, you know, really go all in to this sport. Right. And uh, I I don't know, you know, a lot of people approach the sport as if, you know, they, they, they've got to, you know, they want to be a tournament fisherman, but they have to have a plan B. For some reason, I'd never had that plan B. I was just like, I am going to go to school because I, I think it could help me, you know, in the in the business side of the sport, Mm -hmm. but because I got a marketing degree at, at UCF, but I'm, I'm not going to have a plan B I'm going all in. So after I graduated high school and actually my senior project was doing a, a, uh, kids teen, uh, fishing tournament, Uh which is really cool because a lot of the local companies and stuff sponsored it through some money in and products and things like that. And I, little girl wanted actually. Uh, so this, I think there was a 13 year old girl one, one, oh, she really? won a scholarship for, for, uh, a college actually, uh, which was really, really neat to, to be able to do that before high school fishing was even a thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and part of that, that, that deal, um, that project was also, I had to interview somebody within that ecosystem, you know, that, that industry. Yeah. And so I reached out to Ray Scott, <laughs> yeah of all the people to like yeah. go for first you just went right to the top <laughs> so i i reached out to ray scott and and wrote him a letter and one of the first things i said was you know thank you for you know pretty much building you know this this industry into to what it is today to allow me to follow my dream mm-hmm. and this was way before you know i was i was nothing at that point you know yeah. i didn't know hardly anything about the sport but i wanted to to reach out to him so i did and like it was probably a couple months later, he called me 
and uh, I didn't recognize the voice at first. Right. And uh, and <laughs> when I found out it was him, you know, he wanted to do the interview on the phone, and I kind of finagled my way into actually visiting him at his house oh, wow. in pa- Pilala, Alabama, and and hung out with him it, with my dad uh, for several days and did the interview that way. And I learned a lot from from uh, Ray. And I also that's the first time I met Ken Duke with mm-hmm. uh, that used to be. He's with a uh, fishing tackle retailer now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, he's, uh, and ever since then, you know, just that was kind of the springboard for me moving forward was kind of getting some input in the beginning from those guys. And then just kind of taking that on myself. And, uh, after high school, I moved to Florida, went to college, like you said, yep. and moved into that travel trailer, man. <laughs> I had this little travel trailer that you I mean, moved you didn't into. have a three bedroom, two bath, two nope. car garage. And- nope. I, I knew if I was going to do this, number one, the reason I moved back to Florida was because I knew that I looked at tournament uh, schedules and learned early on. Like, I, I think I realized looking on Bass Fan and uh, looking at people's profiles, almost, I would say four out of five guys, their least favorite lake on the Bass Fan profiles was a Florida lake. Oh, Whether really? it was Okeechobee or they say any Florida lake or anything like that. So I knew that was, and it's also one of the first stops on a schedule every single year. So I knew I needed to learn that. Mm-hmm. So I mo- that's the reason I moved back and I moved into that travel trailer to stay focused. Yep. You know, it, it didn't really help the social life at all, you know, and, and literally for two or three years, other than uh, co-anglers in tournaments, I never fished with a single person down here. I did it all myself pretty right. much. Maybe, maybe just the first two years, not three years, mm-hmm. but um but it was a really hard way to do it, but it was yeah. also the best way to do it because I kind of learned how to you find handle your failure, yeah. you know, because yeah, uh, if yeah. I worked with other people um, I, and also, you know, you also build your own instincts, which yeah. is really, really important. If you learn from other people, then you're constantly questioning your own instincts. Right. And, uh, and but I did have a lot of people, you know, here in Florida that you know, took me under their wing. Yeah. And, ba- and back then there was, and I say back then it wasn't that long ago, but it was still, yeah. it, it's almost like a secondary era to what we're in now. I, I think know. because I look at some of the people that are starting to be towards the tail end of their careers mm-hmm. and starting to get out of it a little bit more, um, that were very prominent 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And those guys are like probably some of the best teachers anybody could have had. Though. Right. Um, because now you, you've got, a, you know, a mixture of people that are taking information from online sources and uh, techniques from other areas and stuff like that. Everybody's jumbling it all together. And like, I don't know that there's as much focus as there was. Right. Like a lot of those guys back then, there was a flipper, there was a frogger, there was a yeah. devil's horse guy, there was, you yeah. know, a worm guy. And now there's like so many multi talented people out there. Yeah. There's really no big like imitation or learn from this guy to learn that thing. Yeah, learn it's from not this like guy. Denny Brower for flipping. Yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, and I kind of miss that. Yeah, a little bit. Well, and you and you had those tournaments where you're you going in, and that's when those guys would shine because right. they knew they were going to go in doing their strength, and right. that was it. You had Rick Clun with a crankbait in his hand. You had Greg Hackney going it with a jig, and if he didn't win with a jig, he, <laughs> you know, that whole deal. <laughs> You might throw a buzz bait. Right, right. <laughs> but you know, it you uh you you had those guys that you expected that if they were gonna pull it out, they were gonna find something nobody else found. Yeah. Um, but what amazed me was when you were telling me about kind of what you did in the you know, the travel trailer days, I guess yeah. you could say, um, fresh out of college and all, all that. You had told me you had started fishing BFLs. Yeah, yeah. And the BFLs you fished weren't just Florida BFLs Mm -hmm. because you lived in Florida, right? Yeah. I one thing that I did early on, and I don't know where I gained the like wisdom early on to to figure that out was that I needed to put. I think it was you know I listened to a lot of different books. Uh, you know, audio books and, and read a lot of different books uh, about, you know, psychology. Uh, one of my favorite is, is, is actually psychology of winning. In fact, I was just listening to it on the way down here. Cause I like mm-hmm. to brush up on it every once in a while. But uh, one of the things that, that is really important and kind of consistent throughout these, these different books um, and, and that you see with different people is you got for you to be able to grow, you have to put yourself 
out of your comfort zone constantly. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that if I wanted to be a well-rounded, versatile angler, I had to not just get comfortable, you know, and, and just dominate a certain area. As soon as I started getting good enough to where I would consistently do well, maybe get some top tens, top fives or something like that, I would move on to the next division. So right. from Florida, which I fished back then, they had the Gator and the Everglades. Uh, and then I think it just got knocked down to Gator. Just the Gator yeah, yeah, just Gator. And then, uh, and then after I started feeling comfortable with those, after college, I moved up to, um, you know, uh, the Alabama and I, the, the different Alabama uh, circuits. And I also fished a lot of different um, uh, BFLs just randomly. Like I fished in North Carolina. I ended up winning a two day BFL up in North Carolina wow. on High Rock, just in the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so all in all, I think I fished seven or eight different divisions of the BFLs. And it's it, at the time it was, I don't know why I kept on doing it because it was so much easier to just go fish Florida lakes and, you know, lakes I feel comfortable with and do well, um, compared to just doing terrible at lakes that I've never been to before. Yeah. But it was the best thing for me was going to those places that I felt uncomfortable because the more you feel uncomfortable and the, the more you just do terrible, um, the, that those are the learning ex experiences. Yep. So the more I did that, the better I got and the more consistent I was across the board. And there's still some areas that like this year, you know, I, I wish that I'd fished like a d division up like the Potomac area yeah. and in up north. But, um, you know, I, but I did a pretty good job of covering, you know, the southern, you know, and central region of the country. Right. Yeah. And I use that as an example. And it, we get questions all the time between me and Hunter here at the shop. Um, we we get a lot of kids that are coming in high school, kids yeah. just out of high school into college. Um, and they've fished now that there's high school fishing, junior fishing, all that stuff, <coughs> um, stuff that you don't, that we didn't have access to back then. It wasn't mm. very popular right. at that point. Um, and so, you know, those kids now are basically learning things that we would have learned in our early twenties right. in their, you know, 10 to 15 yeah. year old area so between YouTube videos and experience and tournament fishing yeah. on the water um and stuff like that so they're accelerated right and so coming out of high school they're like yeah let's i want to be a pro i want to be a yeah. pro and the part that i think that they're missing is the actual experience right of making their own decisions right out of high school <sighs> yeah i i would agree with that and but i would also say that that i think that they're being bombarded too much by too much information yes it, with uh, that excluding that experience that you're talking about yeah experience is way more valuable than information because you can read things on uh, you know in a magazine or online and watch videos but without you completely understanding and getting a feel for it in person you're really not going to absorb it the, the way that you need to to be able to apply it in, in a fishing situation right yeah so they're, the kids are at a, a crazy advantage, but mm -hmm. also a disadvantage if they lean too hard on just the information side yep. and not the application side. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's a, a lot of times um, what I tell some of the guys that come in. We've got some of the younger younger anglers that are fishing the Wednesday yeah. nighters now, and they're only 16 years old. Right. Um, but, you know, those kids are start, starting to place, you know, top three because right. these are their home lakes that they live on or near. And they fish four days a week on the lake and nobody's telling them how to fish them. They're, yeah. they're putting the time in. And the, I always tell everybody, those are the kids that are going to be dangerous in right. about five years because they've been wanting to do nothing but fish since they were 10 years old right? with their John boat going out there or their kayak or their canoe. And their natural instinct to catch and fish has nothing to do with anything anybody can tell them. They'll look up new baits and stuff like that. Yeah. But if it doesn't make sense to things that they've already experienced, they won't, oh, they'll, they'll put it out. <clears throat> That's the big key right there. I mean, and we're just talking about fishing. There's whole other, uh, you know, a part of this equation that we'll probably get into mm -hmm. as far as the business side, but the fishing side, like, the, the guys that you need to watch out for are, are the ones that are willing to get, again, get out of their comfort zone and go to the different regions because they're trying to build a, yep. 
foundation of, of, of versatility. And there's a lot of, of, and also the, the ones that are just embracing it. So like, you know, so recklessly really, you know, they're just like, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to do this. Yep. Those are the, they're going to make it. I mean, Absolutely. and if kids out there are, are watching and you want to do this for a living, you can do it. But really the first step is I, I just had a, 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 a teenager, uh, a high school st- student message me on, um, on Instagram the other day asking me, you know, how do I become a professional fisherman? I really yeah. want to do this. I'm like the very first thing you want to do. And I wrote him a long, like mm-hmm. I didn't respond to him for like a week. And then I finally had a time to sit down and I literally took an hour and just wrote out this whole thing. I, it, but the first thing I said was you have to want it a hundred percent. If there's even a question in your mind that this is not the route you want to take, I'm not saying if there's a question in your mind, whether you can make it or not, I think that a healthy dose of, of like uncertainty is yeah. really, really important to have. Like you need to, to have that, you need to feel uncomfortable to be able to grow. Right. So, uh, but the question is, do you really want it? Yep. If you really, really want it and there's nothing else on the table, you can do it and you can make a good living at it. For sure. For yeah. sure. And, and that's why when we, we get like, we'll do seminars and stuff like that for the right. youth bass masters and stuff around here. Um, and one thing that we've, we've focused on is we use you as a study case oh. um, for those, because I, I tell everybody, Honored. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell everybody that, you know, there's, it, there's no easy way to do it. Some right. people really do get the easy way they do. I wouldn't say it's easy. Well, I wouldn't say it's faster. It's faster. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, You know, if you've got the funding, if you've got the, you know, the, the industry contacts or, you know, the right people sometimes that will push you along, but you still got to catch the fish. Yeah. Um, you still got to do the business side of things. Yeah. And the, the thing that we use you for though, on, on a case study basis, I would say, or an example, I should say, um, is the guys that are trying to know when it's time to move the next level and the next level and the next level. Right. And I, I always tell them, don't go before you're ready. Right. And just like the guys are like, Oh, I'm going to travel with you guys on the opens and yeah. fish as a boater. And I'm like that, you know, everybody's had that thought. Yeah. But go as a co-angler for three years, yeah. two to three years and see how you do mm-hmm. and see if being a co-angler is holding you back. Right. Or if you're learning lessons. And the co-angler route works for, for a lot of people. It didn't work well for me. Mm -hmm. I just had to have control over my situation. So I wouldn't necessarily say that co-angler route is the the route you need to go, but you need to be prepared. Like if you move up to the next level, it's to learn. Like, so, so the approach that, that I always took was I always wanted to fish against the best that I possibly could without breaking my bank, like completely, you know, right. obliterating it completely. So that's where the BFLs mm-hmm. came into play. But once you start getting somewhat comfortable and start having to s- some success, you need to knock yourself back a peg and move up to that next level and get your, your butt handed to you for right. a little bit. That's my opinion. But when it comes to the tour level, you definitely don't want to jump into it right away. We're talking 30 thousand plus dollars in entry fees a year uh, if you're just fishing one circuit and you're talking about extreme you know uh extreme expenses you know of course the expenses are very similar across the board right but uh the the entry fees are really really big so you don't want to burn yourself out right away but when it comes to like the bfls through the triple a level such as the toyota series or the opens you definitely want to jump i say if you can afford it Go get your butt handed to you, but you need to remember that you're going to lose way, way yep. more than you win. You're not going to make a living at it. You're not going to, you're not hardly ever going to break even at that level. Um, but you're, you're building that, that like fortitude mm-hmm. and fortitude is what, what it's all about. Right. Like being able to just be like, well, that sucked, but I learned so much from it. I think that's the hardest part for me Super going hard. to going to the boater part right. 
you know, the co-angler part, you're like, oh, it sucked, but you can always blame it that you had a bad right. boat. Oh, yeah, you, I had a you've bad always got excuses. Put me out in the middle oh, of nowhere. he backboated me. He did this. Take Sahara out here. I, I only had one guy that, that was really mean to me, but and he was fine the first part of the day, but, man, it was like I got – he had been – what it was is he was frustrated with himself. Right. And he was getting hung up a bunch, and yeah. I wasn't, and I was catching the fish, and he wasn't, and – it wasn't any other thing other than he was just frustrated right. and spun out. Yeah, and that's what and, happens. And it happens. And um, and I wasn't throwing up on him or nothing. I stayed in my back little corner. Yeah. And I would hope you wouldn't throw up on him. <laughs> <It'd> get messy. <laughs> um, so no, I, I wasn't like going out of my boundaries or anything like right. that. And right. Um, I mean, you fished with me. I mean, yeah. Same thing. It's, we practiced. Yeah. And um, but you know, it was the aggravating part that got me that tournament and uh it was smith lake actually yeah. um but we I, I got hung up the second time all day in like at noon and he had one fish in the boat and was like perturbed <laughs> and uh he was getting ready to go buy it and he just kept going i'm like hey man i'm hung up is all right if you go get it and he's like yeah you're gonna have to break that one <laughs> Okay, I'll let my tungsten go. Bye bye. You want a tackle shop? Well, hold on, <laughs> that's coming. Oh, that's coming. Um, we went and uh, we're we're going around and uh, we're heading that way. And I, I at this point I'm like a little annoyed, so I did the typical co angler thing when we're going around a little cove. I cut the cove off, right? But it's still in my zone, mm -hmm. you know, not being yeah, disrespectful. Yeah. He's going around, you know, like this, and I make the cast right across. Um, because I could reach it with a pop bar. Well, yeah. there was one vine hanging down where I was trying to throw that pop bar, and it caught the vine. The dude swung a 180 from the direction he was going. He I was literally just holding on to it, waiting for us to get there, and I was gonna rip it out of the vine because the boat was the way he was going, the boat was gonna go under it. Right. I ended up he ended up turning around and going the other way. I said, Hey man, I'm stuck. And he's like Yep, good thing you own a tackle shop. Oh no! And bro and made me break it. Oh yep. man, that's <laughs> never a good yeah. thing. I've been. That, really that's the only only experience. Everybody else has been great. You know, accommodating. Um, I had a scary ride to tie. That's a whole other yeah. story. Um, but other than that, you know, um, did we practice for Champlain? Together? Yes, actually, I told oh, wow. I told uh, last week a story to Vern Kemp, or uh, last podcast to Vernon Kemp. Um, about that uh because you scared the crap out of me in practice i bet uh, it, was, <laughs> it was there was one rough day it wasn't even really a rough day it was there was a yacht coming through but i've nah. now used this trick ever since then I, oh did I, I do the turn yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. so the the whole the the yacht was going straight across and we yeah. were going to go straight across their wake yeah you don't want to do that yeah and so you you went straight towards the wake cut to the the stern of the boat yeah came like 20 feet off the back of the boat and went out the other side of the wake yeah. and i'm sitting there panicking the whole time thinking we're about <laughs> to eat it and we never even like the boat didn't even shift or nothing it just yeah just i just bee. i just sew the i just call it sewing the uh the, the wake yep. there you know just kind of you parallel it going yep. into it and you don't necessarily have to go towards the boat I don't remember getting that close to the boat, but uh, I can tell you in the passenger seat, everything <laughs> exaggerated, but zigzag. And then, and then you go, uh, you know, yeah. in the, in the calm water in yep. between the wakes. But yeah, it's, it's a, my co-anglers always love that one Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> they're like, Oh my gosh, he's, he's going yeah. still 50 miles an hour yep. right now. And then all of a sudden I do that. Well, and you got to, you got to thread the needle in right. because if you don't, it can get dicey if, yeah. you, if you miss your moment. Yeah. So you've got to kind of like head towards the side of the boat and like time it to where you're going to come in right behind them. Right, right. But yeah, no, I, I did that on Chickamauga on one of the yachts on Chickamauga. My co-angler was doing the same thing. It's the way to do it, man. And I, I was like, man, Miles taught me something. <laughs> That's It really is. I mean, if you have a, a substantial wake, that is by far the best way to do it as For opposed sure. to stopping and getting a little swamped because yeah. you won't get wet at all doing that. No, not at all. And it's, and it'll be a lot faster and a lot easier on your equipment. Yeah. And your coiler. <laughs> but like it was things like that, that right. riding along with somebody experienced in driving, um, you know, that you may not learn jumping into it all by yourself. Yeah. 
like the the first day of like a day on Champlain in practice, I know a lot of guys that were coming back going, Oh, I took three over the bow today. Right. It was so rough out there. And I came back and I'm like, man, it was fine. That, yeah. <laughs> That's my, Ala- yeah. My Alaska, you know, uh, pedigree, you know, uh, cause I guide up there yep. every year for the last 16 years. I'm going up in September this year. Uh, that's where I learned how to, you know, we're completely different style boats and all that, yeah. but it does transfer over as far as being able to read the water and things like that. Uh, bass boats are way less advantageous to be running in any seas over five feet, but they can still handle it just fine as long as you know how to maneuver. I mean, last year, shoot, I took the craziest run I've ever made with on Erie from, from yep. Sandusky all the way up to anchor Bay and St. In St. Clair, 90, almost 95 miles each way. And, and uh, for 45 miles straight going across Erie, it was like four to six footers. Oh my goodness. You know, the, the first day it took me three hours and six minutes to get there. Oh, that's, you know, that's where the Alaska thing comes into play because it was like if i didn't have experience in rough water well i saw people breaking their whole console off and yeah, that's a, that's another thing that's another thing like for people that are looking to get into it alaska i really uh give a lot of credit to for teaching me self-reliance and be, having you know a do-it-yourself mentality because i don't hear on the road especially when you don't have a service team i mean we're really spoiled on the on the yeah. pro circuit is because we got these great service crews uh you know uh, you know mercury has a has a trailer there's all these different brands at power pole um and so we can get our stuff worked on by, by professionals you know yep. people that are like legit the best in the business um but but early on learning how to do things myself was really important i still have parts like i have parts for parts i mean that i've collected throughout the years and have learned how to 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 do that. And that's one of the things that has really benefited me is learning how to do things myself. And every single time somebody has to fix something on my boat, I'm right there learning from them. Right. Because uh, when you go up to a place like, like Erie, I didn't have anything break on my boat that week because I've got everything cinched down. I carry all these different straps with me. I've got everything tightened up. And then I see guys coming back to the, the ramp and their engines are just barely hanging onto the yep. back of their boats they didn't you're not gonna see that yeah you're, i'm stuff. going through the same stuff and you won't see that from me yep yeah well because, and sometimes it's the way they drive their boat too like well, everybody yeah, see, everybody to seems to think the that they, they could do their boats, they, yeah. they could do 60 over three or four footers and no. you know take that, your time man that was like I, my ride to tie we did 65 the whole way at champlain that day no thank uh, you the whole way down yeah. and, and it was crazy because it's that as a co-angler the first time being on champlain and not knowing what to expect mm. it was the scariest first day because as soon as anybody i knew heard i was going to tie <laughs> with a with a boater and i had no control over the situation Do you have life insurance <laughs> the, 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 seriously everybody was like man he's like be careful yeah and like everybody was having serious discussions be, with yeah, it because be you got to remember too is right after the nick kaler thing yeah um you oh, know, that's right. That was, yeah. yeah, it was like six months after the Nick Kaler thing on Okeechobee. Yeah. Um, and so everybody was real on edge about all that right. stuff. And everybody I knew came up to me and was like, Hey, um, if you're going tomorrow, don't be afraid to tell your boater to, to cut for, it out and, and slow for down. Real, or, yeah. Cause that, that's, you know, some guys, they just get the adrenaline going. That's, now, I will say though, um, that was the driest riot ride of my life doing 65 the whole way there yeah um when we got there the back deck of his boat had screws hanging out about that far the whole I way i believe it yeah um but we made it and uh we got there in an hour and 10 minutes um down to the chestnuts whoa <laughs> wow <laughs> they see yeah th- those those sort of runs aren't really a problem once you 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 do a few of them as long yeah. as weather permits. Well, and we got lucky. Sometimes the, you know, it kind of shifted into like, like a Southwest a little okay. bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the islands kind of came right. to play a little right. bit. So you'd get like five miles of smooth water or, or two to three foot chop. Yeah. And then you would get back into the three to fives and it'd be three, 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 five, three, 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 five. And you would know it every time because the boat would be going and then you'd hit that last one and it would yeah. go, just go skyrocketing. Yeah. Yeah. But we never stuffed one. Yeah, I'll, that's, I'll give it that. Yeah, well, it, 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 the one thing that I've I've 
last year was an eye opener because in Alaska, I carry a, a big, you know, safety bag. Yeah. It's got a different name, but it's, you know, essentially a waterproof bag that I carry a bunch of different safety gear. I've got a, a personal locating beacon, mm -hmm. you know, POB, a VHF radio, handheld, submersible, float, uh, you know, uh, buoyant radio. Um, and I've got spare clothes. I've got, I've got food. I've got, you know, a couple bottles of water, fire making, you know, material. I've got CPR cards and, and first aid and all that stuff in there um for alaska because it's like if you get stranded out there you may be spending the night on shore somewhere right. and you you're gonna have to fend for yourself i do the same thing in 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 bass boats now and i i tell my marshals you know especially when i'm going to a big body water or it's going to get rough i carry that bag with me and that's that's one thing i think that a lot of uh bass fishermen overlook is i mean Really, it, it seems like we've got all these different resources and somebody's going to find you. But we learned from what happened with Nick um, and that is, it was such a tragedy that that we really need to take safety more seriously, yeah. if, if not for ourselves, for our families and the people that we have on the boat with us. Yep. You know, and so that's that's one thing that that I've taken seriously. And and uh, a mutual friend of ours. Hunter also takes very yep. seriously. Hunter, I mean, the mo moderator for the yeah, day. Yeah, we. I mean, bass fishermen in general. I think we take it for granted. I think that every single person should have a PLB mm -hmm. and uh, and a VHF radio. VHF radio seems like it's 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 kind of out there, but really, when you're going to the Great Lakes or, or any yeah, of those anywhere giant where bodies, you've got fifty plus miles of water that you can be on at any right. given point. I mean. <laughs> It makes sense. Most of these places have a Coast Guard outpost yeah. somewhere. You know, if it's a large body, especially if it's a, a, a navigable body of water, they're going to yeah. have they're going to be monitoring channels and in, in in some yeah, they'll have helicopter and all that stuff. Yeah, so it's it, I think that that's really important. You can still push it. Like I've had a, a lot of uh, co anglers and and marshals get uncomfortable with it, but you know. I know where my limits are and where the boat's limits are. And I'm not going to put myself in a position if the, if something mechanical does happen yeah. that we're in really deep trouble. That's yeah. just not, that's, that's the thing. I heard that was the thing in Sandusky because of the, the Canadian border stuff was right. at play. Like yeah. you couldn't were, go cause you were allowed to run over the border, it, but you're not allowed to stop. Over you can't the stop. Yeah. If, so if you step a wave, you know, yeah. of course it, it, it all depends on if they, they get to you. By right. then, obviously, yeah. but but a lot of legally, yeah, legally, you're not uh, you weren't allowed to stop in there. So it was pretty sketchy, but it, it was also kind of necessary to make that swing into uh, Canada, you know, to to be safe. And yeah. I know I went in just a little bit, you know, as as pretty much every single person that was running up there. Um, but safety, man, is is so absolutely important. And again, if not for you, the person that you're with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, and that's why I tell a lot of the kids that are ready to go to the boater side right. of things too, that are, um, have been doing high school and whatever else right. when they want to talk about going to BFLs and, and draw yeah. tournaments is, uh, the first question I ask them is, are you ready to be responsible for right. someone else's life? Yeah. You know, cause the minute you strap that life vest on and you hit go in the morning, right. You, that ride in the morning, that race boat ride, whether you're first or last Ricky Bobby in it, you right. know, it's the first thing to remember is that when right. you get there, you need to make sure everybody's there. You yeah. Know, you don't want to lose a co-angler out the boat on the way there, that whole deal. And that's happened plenty of times too. Right. It, but it, it shouldn't, yeah. you, sh you, sh you should do, you need to be ready to make good judgment calls. For sure. Like as, as a, as a professional tournament angler, that means not, always pushing it to the the absolute limits of your equipment and and you physically are being like out lightning storms and yeah you know. there's plenty of really rough water that you can run safely mm -hmm. okay it, it's just a, ma a matter of knowing you know having the experience to know what kind of water you can actually you know traverse these large areas and and what what you can't you yep. know, and, and it, you need to start making those judgment calls. There's some guys that'll go regardless, but that is a, that is something that, you know, and, and these are rare situations. Usually a tournament director will cancel a tournament. If it's bad enough. If yeah. it's that bad, but most conditions that we're allowed to go out and you can, you can navigate your way through that. If you're a skilled driver, 
Um, but I see a lot of guys that just don't know what they're doing at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm still learning, you know, and, and also just, just overall, like one of the things that I, I see people do is they always want to send it. They yep. always want to send it hard, man. They just, they yeah. just want to go out there. And, and the, like you said, the adrenaline's pumping and, and I do this, the same thing. Like I'm excited. I'm, I want to get out there. But one thing that you have to do as a professional, as you're building your, your reputation yep. is, you know, make good judgment calls. Yep. We don't always make good judgment calls, you know, whether it's running, you know, trying to av- avoid getting in somebody's, you know, area as they're casting, as you're running or something like that. Maybe you make a bad judgment call, but it's hold yourself accountable for the bad judgment calls and learn from them. That's one of the things that I would have to say that is constantly overlooked. Like, yep. and, and we need to pay attention to. Absolutely. Yeah. So now that, um, you're on the pro circuit. Yep. Um, what, what was that transli- transition like going from, you know, like a BFL angler yeah. to an opens angler to a pro circuit angler? Scary and a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the first year, you know, back when it was branded the FLW tour, mm-hmm. um, I literally had, I had like $3,000 and I, you know, this was during the whole transition with, you know, the BPT just starting out. And so there's some openings in the, the, the tour Mm -hmm. and, and ended up getting in, got the, the, the invitation. And then I had to figure out the money. And fortunately, you know, everything started coming together. I was able to pull from all the relationships that I built over the years and uh, now have a, a great, you know, sponsor portfolio that 44 tackle is part of this year. And And it's interesting too, because I remember back in the day when we first started, you know, me being new to the the stuff and whatever, mm-hmm. I'm like, man, it'd be cool to do something with you. And you're yeah. like, I would never do that to you. And I go, <laughs> and I go well, what do you mean? You wouldn't? He's like, we're friends. You know, I, I said that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, you, things, you, have, things have changed. I think that the best, the best people <laughs> to work with nowadays are my friends. Absolutely. But no, back then you, you said we're friends. You know, I just don't think that I would like to tarnish that area of the relationship. That was probably because I didn't but, have the value. back Well, then. and also we didn't have the ability probably right to make a difference back then right you know for for that situation um and also exposure wise we weren't ready for any kind of exposure at that point i don't think knowing that now um and we're still learning lessons you know this year is our first year really going with the elite series side with matt robertson you on the pro circuit side and we've had laramie strickland last year Mm -hmm. um you know we were lucky crushed it Rookie season. Exactly. Second tournament of the year. Wins a home tournament. Wins it. I was second in that. You were. At one point. Yep. Yep. I thought I had that one. I really did. (laughs) It was was cool because like the last day I'm there and I'm like excited no matter what happens at that point because I'm like, oh, we got Laramie and we got Miles and, you know, I've sat there with Katie and then uh, uh, Andrea Mm -hmm. um, and we're we're all talking or whatever. And I I got to meet your dad finally. Yeah. Um, That was awesome. Yeah. Um, You know. And the, and the uh, his dog, I think it was he had with him. It wasn't Doppler. No, it no, was okay. before yeah, Doppler. His, his dog, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, but, I lost my train of thought. What but they, uh, we've been you know lucky enough to have those relationships. Yeah, and yeah. be in the right place, right time. But you know, it was kind of cool that out of nowhere, you know, and I thought you you had previous relationships that kind of mm. you know you. With, with the TV show and everything right. like that. Um, there's always been a gray area there with tournament fishing. Right. Yeah. And uh, I don't know that we were quite ready to link right. up on that, but now it's been, I wasn't either. Yeah. And, and that's actually a great segue into, and I don't mean to yeah. derail what you're, yeah, yeah. you're thinking, but one of the, cause we're kind of talking about like beginnings mm-hmm. and like how to grow in the sport and how to become a professional. And one of the things that I had to learn the hard way um, was that, that one of the most important things to balances to figure out early on is, you know, what your value is and don't undervalue yourself or overvalue yourself to a sponsor. And I probably was going from a, a, a position of, I don't think I have the value for you. So I would rather not open that door right now until I do have value, which, you know, nowadays I, you know, I've got more reach. Um, I'm able to, 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 you know, kind of uh, provide value for my sponsors. And so it was a better situation, but that's one thing that 
early on, I tell, I tell kids, you know, especially high school kids that are getting into the sport, don't focus on the sponsorship network, focus on networking yep. and building uh, uh, friendships and relationships with people within the, the industry and learning from them, not asking anything from them. In fact, giving, uh, giving, uh, them the opportunity to, to have them, you help them, you yep. know, it asks them like we're going to ICAST this week. Right. Yep. And ICAST is one of the best ways to, to network and meet people within the industry, you know, and, and for the, when you're first starting out, don't ask for anything. Like yep. don't ask for those discounts, you know, I pay for it yourself. Listen, I, I had pennies in my bank account at, at certain points. You know, mm -hmm. I had probably, I remember I had like, Twelve dollars in my bank account once when I was down uh, in near Camp Mac. I checked the the ATM. And I'm like, I need to make a top five in this tournament to make it home. You know, yeah. I remember making yeah. a check in it, and I ended up getting a top five. I think everybody hears those stories, but yeah. nobody actually no. understands what it's like to it's be legit. there. Where yeah. that that you're, you know, you go out of town, yeah. and I mean, we've we've had it all the time. Um, yeah. But you know, you decide what you're your next five days is going to look like and how you're going to make it happen or get somebody to wire you some money over the phone or, you know, yeah, that's one of the, it's one of the worst feelings, but it's one of the best things that you can do for yourself is, uh, you know, again, put yourself in an uncomfortable position. It makes but, you work harder. Yeah. And going back to the networking thing, it's, yeah. it's early on. It's all about building those relationships and understanding value yep. for yourself. I, again, I, I made the same mistakes. Like I've started out and I went for sponsorships because, you know, with companies and, and, and I had some great friendships with those companies. But one thing that I learned, uh, after that is it's harder to scale that when you yep. start getting value, it's harder to scale those relationships. So it's almost better to start out just paying, you know, retail, just buy the products that you enjoy using, go out there, do the videos, build your social media platforms nowadays uh, and, and network. And then, you know, once you start getting to the the opens or, or to Toyota level or the tour level and you've got a following and, and you've got that value, that's when you focus on sponsorship. But I just wanted to kind of yeah. go into that one because that's actually well, and one if of you the don't have a platform. Things. What are they paying for? Right. Exactly. And you're just going to burn a bridge. And right. that's one of the worst things you can do in the sport because it's very small. Go to ICAST. It's, it seems it's, huge. It seems but that's big, it. but yeah, no, it, you, you and, and I didn't realize that until like my third year in business. Right. Like I knew it was, you know, pretty yeah. tight knit, but I didn't realize that it was tight knit enough that, you know, me being a shop only three years in right. could walk through ICAST and, and, you know, meet and talk with 50, 60 people right. in a day. And it didn't start clicking on the networking side of things until you know, you walk down the aisle and suddenly there's people that you want to say hi to, but you're like, right. I'm busy, but I want to say hi. And, you know, yeah. you get all that going on. Um, but that's part of it is you never know when you really need to make sure those relationships hit and you stop and say hi and shake hands with everybody because you never know when that's going to help you out here in the right. next 10 years. Always make yourself available and visible. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's it, man. And it like, everybody wants to know how to get sponsors. That's it. Just, be friends with people, never burn a bridge, be nice to people and, uh, and Pick build, up the phone. build your personal brand as we yep. call it and, uh, and build your platforms. And once you do that and you're able to, to, you know, like if you put out a video, if people want to watch your videos, that's when these sponsors have value. And, and eventually those companies that you've been friends with somebody for a long period of time will have an opportunity for you. Or yep. what, one thing that happens in this industry a lot is, that one guy that was the marketing director for one company yep. that uh, didn't have an opening for you, it just didn't make sense for them, moves over to another company. And they're just like, I know the exact person yep. that we need to call and first. And that's how and you, that's you how, even put us on the table. Right. That's that's how I've, it, the best deals have happened for me. And yep. obviously a lot of the the best deals, you know, especially like a company like Z-Man mm -hmm. has, has also come through through the show as well. Yep. So th that can't be discounted, but I I'm telling you just because I have a show doesn't mean that most of the, the, the best networking opportunities have been before that just showing up, just being available, trying to figure it out. Like, and I was terrible on camera, like in the early days, I remember Ken Duke gave me like an opportunity to do some videos. Mm -hmm. Um, 
uh, for for the Bassmaster website way back in the day, like 2007, and I was a just a bumbling mess. <laughs> I could not get through. I one remember 45 seconds. It tip. was funny the first time I fished with you. I didn't figure out quite exactly where I had recognized you from, and the the first one it was the. Uh, when it was the Oakley Big Bass Tour. Right, yeah. I had mentioned to you that I had fished that. You're like, oh, I used to right. do that. I was on their TV show thing or yeah. whatever. And I was like, oh, man, that's where I knew you from. Yeah. But um, this is, that, I mean, that's a perfect example because I, I worked <laughs> with the Big Bass Tour. Mm -hmm. And then I and then that sprung into working with Sweetwater because mm -hmm. a lot of the companies, as long as you build that good reputation and you don't oversell yourself or undersell yourself, you know, overselling yourself means, you know, uh, over promising and under delivering and then the opposite for for underselling yourself, not truly understanding your value. It's a really hard balance to find, but it's it's super important because if you it, it, either one will damage your career for right. the long term, especially overselling yourself. Yeah. You know, thinking that you're worth more than you actually are to a company is really, really dangerous because not only are you uh, precluding yourself from a opportunity with that company, but in, if that person that's a marketing director moved to another company, you're not going to have an opportunity with them. And you might actually ruin an opportunity for somebody else that has legitimate value right. at that time. I'm not saying that like everybody has value. Everybody's got a... Yeah. a everybody's got a fan base that they mm -hmm. can tap into because everybody's very unique. Some have a bigger fan base than others, um, but everybody's going to have value. It's just, you got to build that value. You, it doesn't happen overnight. Absolutely. So, so what, um, where did the TV show start? How did that all come about? Sweetwater. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever asked you anything about how you got started with the TV show. Well, it started so out. That's with, a personal interest. It started out with me dry fishing, uh, uh, Tom Roland, one of the producers, yep. really hardcore on on Gunnersville. We went out to a spot that I'd been catching bass for months, and went out there and caught sand bass, you know, white bass the entire time. So <laughs> I dry fished the producer, but the way that it ended up happening was the Big Bass Tour. Uh, I worked with for several years and uh, had a great time with them, uh, Mark and Keith, uh, and uh, ended up um, once I kind of graduated from that, I started fishing some you know, like uh, a Toyota series events. And that precluded me from actually continuing on with the big bass tour. And uh, after that, you know, I had a good reputation with some of the the people that I work with, um, with some of the brands that were a sponsor of that show. So when the producers, uh, Tom and Rich uh, for, for Sweetwater, what was to become Sweetwater, were looking where they were asking, you know, their, their partners, you know, anybody, that's young, that's a bass fisherman. We're looking to do this, this freshwater show. Um, uh, my name came up through those sponsors. And then of course, Joey Nania's name mm -hmm. came up, uh, primarily because he had, uh, worked with Tom Roland before. Okay. Um, so it was just happened, you know, it, like everything else in my career, it's just serendipity, you know, it just, it just happened because of a, a series of decent choices, yep. you know, and that's, really what it's all about is just, you know, continuing to, to, to move forward without burning bridges. And right. that's how it came about. It's just, and then, and then once I dry fished them that one day, you know, uh, I did a not video and did terrible on that. And for some reason he still hired me. <laughs> I so, think, I think you're a, your own worst critic. Cause yeah, you, you, you do things am. all the time that we, we look at and we're like, this is great. You're like, you sure you don't want me to shoot this like four more times. <laughs> I do that all the time. Yeah. I'm, I'm the worst at being critical of myself yeah but but perfection sometimes it, it takes a little while to be the harshest on yourself to to get what you perfect perfection is unattainable yeah exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the crazy thing is like when i'm doing youtube videos mm -hmm. um i do so many takes sometimes i used to uh mm -hmm. nowadays i just breeze through it and right whatever happens happens we, we call that's what we call you the one take charlie yeah that's what's that's what's normal now but Back in the day, I would take so many takes, but like if somebody was to do want me to do a video, I'll, I'll do it in one take. Yep. And, and just if I stumble, I stumble, whatever it is, you know. So, and that's what you got to do, really. As a if you're a professional, you just move through those mistakes. Well, that's why I told uh, you know we've got the the employees and the, the our coworkers here um, that we're 
starting to work with on content and stuff because right. I want it to be a natural feel here at 44 Tackle. Right. Um, so we've got the other guys actually doing their own videos mm-hmm. and we'll go over stuff and then, you know, I'll spit, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show them. I'll say, look, it's not, you're making it more complicated than you have to, you know, the facts about the product that you're talking right. about. And then I'll spit it out and just and get, run with it real quick. Yeah. And they're like, how'd you do it? So like easy and quick. And I said, the problem is, is you're putting bullet points in your head and you're trying to read these bullet yeah. points. And when you misread a bullet point in your head, you stumble over it. Every and that, bullet, that causes the snowball. Everything, yeah. And if you can just think about the couple of things that are important to remember, yeah. And then just say, look at the thing, and then say, this is exactly what I like from it, from the heart, exactly right. what it is. Yeah. You'll never stumble. You just keep right. on going. And if you just try to have a good time doing it, but yeah. it's dude, it's way harder than that to, to just say it. <laughs> yeah, is yeah, one no. thing from uh, yeah, you know, f- but to do it yeah. is so scary sometimes i remember watching kvd after i had just completely bombed doing videos for for ken mm-hmm. um uh we were down at Kissimmee. it was the one that ben matsubu won mm-hmm. side imaging was just brand new and uh i remember i had just bombed couldn't get a good take and then kvd came over and they're just like uh you want to do a video he's just like, sure what do you want to do and they just blurred something out he's like all right i'm ready and he, he just did it like that. I yeah. was like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do that. Now nowadays, I, yeah, <laughs> nowadays I can because, you know, it's just practice. It's like people are just like, oh, his dad was an actor. Of course, he's going to be good on camera. I was awful, awful. And not just from a, you know, introspective, you know, yeah. critique. Like anybody would have said that guy's terrible. Probably not going anywhere. <laughs> so has now, now that you brought it up, I wasn't going to bring it up, but you brought it up. So. Yeah. How um, does that reflect in how you, you you handle yourself with the TV show and everything else? Does uh, Has your dad helped in any of that? Or did you learn anything, I should say, you, from any of that kind of stuff? Uh, the one thing that I learned from my dad that was so invaluable during this this whole career I process. I guess anybody that doesn't know, explain who your dad yeah, is. Yeah, so my dad played Radar on the TV series MASH, which is the reason why most people call me Sonar. You right, know? right. That's where the, the nickname came from. Uh, but really what, what... And I didn't know that for like the first three years that <laughs> I knew you, by the way. Yeah, I, I don't we were, mention it because I don't a, think to Until we were it. at Champlain, I read the article to you <laughs> that Bass wrote uh, uh, on the way down to Ty, and you're like, they would put that in there, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't... I don't even think about it. Everybody yeah. says, well, how does it feel to, you know, I, it was no different for me, yeah. but, uh, my dad, you know, occasionally my dad and I'll talk, of course, the, the, the advice that my dad gives me is, is usually like, Oh, well, you know, contracts or something like that. And like, I'm like, I have to tone it down a little bit. I'm like, dad, this is fishing, right? right. Not Fox. Right. You know, not a nationally <laughs> beloved television yep. show. Like it's a little bit different. Not like the, the, the contracts to... are going to look a little bit different, yeah. but about, uh, about half the size. Yeah. <laughs> not even. Yeah. You know, it, 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 yeah. But it, so, it's, but the best advice that I got from him, it, really the best thing I, I got was the fact that, that he did it. Mm-hmm. He did what he wanted to do in his career. He went after it. So, I had that and I want, that's what I want to kind of like, that's why I want to reach out to, to, you know, anybody, any young newcomers into the sport and say, you can do it. Like, yep. it, but seeing my dad, how he did that early on in his career and how he, you know, went all in, um, gave me the courage, I think. So that's like the biggest thing that having a father, you know, like my dad, yeah. um, did for me was give me the courage in, 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 and the, you know, the, he just gave me that courage, man, yeah. to, to go after it, you know, and that's, that's probably the biggest thing. But Family far- support's huge when it comes to fishing. Cause yeah. it is quite taxing. You, I yeah. mean, your wife's great. She yeah. very supportive. My mom um, was my biggest fan. Yeah. My mom was my biggest fan. Yeah. She was, she was the best. She's, she, uh, she was the, the biggest support system I had. Of course, my wife now is the biggest support system I have. Um, but, uh, yeah, you always need that, that one person that like believes in you wholeheartedly. Cause there was so many years where like, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it here, but I'm, I was in tears. Cause I just, I'm in this trailer yeah. that's full of ants. <laughs> 
got nothing to eat, <laughs> trying to find quarters for the for the laundry machine. And uh, and I'm just not getting anywhere in the sport. And so it's so important to have somebody there that's just like, you know, uncompromising with their their belief right. that you're going to make it. Not being the person in your ear going, you should quit now. You should quit yeah. now. Go, oh, go but yeah, my, my dad was always just like, <laughs> well, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it, you know, it's, it's making a whole lot of money. He always believed in me and he always he always yeah. uh, was supportive but it was always like, as a, I'm sure as a father, you know, you want to see your kid, you know, making money, yeah, you know, yeah. and this is a very abnormal, um, career path highs and lows. Yeah, exactly. So, but he also understood, I mean, cause yeah. he went through the same thing. I mean, it's right. it, highly unlikely to succeed at acting as yeah. it is in, in fishing, but it's very likely that you'll succeed as long as you continually push forward. Yep. And yeah. find new, new routes this is this is such an uplifting podcast i try we're <laughs> we're talking about s such good information well know. so uh, we we i started this because the the thing that i got tired of watching was news podcasts right like if i wanted to read news and things like that nothing you know there's a lot of informative ones that cover all the stuff mm -hmm. i'm not the best person to keep track of everything that's out right. there so but I, one thing that's always interests me was you know i've heard all these names when i because like i like i've only started fishing about set bass fishing right about seven eight years ago now right um in, in any kind of serious look at it mm -hmm. um and so basically had three years under my belt opened a tackle store <laughs> you, you know <laughs> um but i always felt like i needed to have some sort of like now you can get all the poppers you want it, <laughs> exactly um no i i think that it, it's been one of those things that i've always in life like to do a youtube channel to do any kind of mm -hmm. thing like that i always felt like i had to give something or have something to offer and i i was always afraid of trolls yeah so i, I never i was always afraid of the keyboard warriors that were going to beat me down the whole way and say you suck you this and that i whatever. still am <laughs> I, you know i'm over it you, you know what yeah. will get you over it real quick and i know you haven't jumped on there yet but tiktok yeah post videos on tiktok you will get over trolls real quick yeah <laughs> well no. um but no in general um the the thing that i wanted to do was bring something that actually brought something to the table right as opposed to regurgitating the same stuff everybody else is doing right um the I want to bring what actually interests me out. And right. so I hear these names, you know, the Robbie Krosner's, the Trevor Fitzgerald's, the Miles Berghoff's, the, uh, you know, Mikey balls we've had on, mm -hmm. uh, for he's a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the story of like start to where they're at now yeah. always interests me because, and I think that that's the stories that all of the, you know, the youth coming up in the programs yeah. need to hear, um that there's no mold zero to yeah. be kvd yeah the, you know no, there's there's not and i and i'm sure if you listen to his story too and i've it's talked to him a different. bunch a bunch of times on different things um but his story is unique also right um but i think as far as role models go there's there's a few really good ones mm. and um, that are willing to talk about it right and you come to mind every time I on I, the top of my list anyway I love, and it's because i know you but yeah i love talking about it i really do and because I, I think it's one of the most important parts of the sport is sharing you know even though there's not a path to go there there's definitely things that you can do wrong that you right. shouldn't you shouldn't do and uh, i've been through it all like this is not something that i took you know i t i have taken this so dead serious since leaving california and moving into that travel trailer it's not even funny it's been my one focus yep. you know and uh and but and i have a lot of people just think that it comes easy it doesn't come easy at all in fact the I, this whole journey is still just full of uncertainty mm -hmm. and like you never know but as long as you just push forward that's kind of the the thing that gets you to the next level constantly i mean um yeah I, it, if i was to say one thing to to 
you know, kids out there, aside from the things that I've, I've said is just, just go out there and do it. Give it your everything. It's going to eventually work out. Like it wasn't like three or four years ago that I really started making a true living in this sport. Right. You know, but I've been at it for, for so crazy long, you know, and, and again, I was eating mustard sandwiches. My, my friends in Alaska laugh at me all the time. And it's like an inside joke because that, you know, my boss is constantly just like, oh, man, I need to send you a, a gift card, to Red <laughs> Lobster. I was working at Red Lobster. And oh, okay. just like, get you off those mustard sandwiches. Because I would actually, there was one week where I just had bread and mustard in the refrigerator. And that's all I could afford. You know, oh. yeah, it's, it, it sounds. Well, and, that, and, and that's why I talk about with people that say, oh, that's expensive to go do this and that. Yeah. It's only as expensive. Like there's things you need. Right. Right. But there's ways to make yourself efficient mm-hmm. on the road. Right. You know, you travel with multiple people to split a house or, or you don't even need to you sleep the, in the back of the truck. Yeah. Um, if you want it bad enough, yeah. you can find the right ways. But, you know, like thinking about boat gas, mm-hmm. you don't have to run all over God's creation at 70 mile an hour. Right. You know, you can do 35 mile an hour pretty much everywhere and you'll take more <laughs> in from the experience, too. Yeah. But um you know, or you can localize yourself on a lake where you just take your your initial run around and say, look, right. I'm going to quadrant it off because I think this is my most efficient yeah. area and really pick it apart and figure that area out yeah. and make that yours mm-hmm. um, instead of spreading yourself thin. And you can really save a lot of money in that, too, and be more efficient. Yeah. And then the other thing is don't have your eye on the prize the whole time that right. you don't treat it like is a necessity to win to pay your bill tomorrow yeah you need to take the experience and you need to go out there and try to win but not because you're paying bills right you need to go out there and win because you want to win right yeah the money (laughs) that's one thing that that really bothers me because i feel like a lot of people really put off the wrong attitude and vibes towards the Mm up-and-comers this is a great sport to make money in it's also a great sport to, to have very inconsistent income. But if you work at the business side as good, as well as the fishing side, you can make a great living at it. And but I hear so many people say, well, you have to have a ton of money to, to be able to do this thing. You don't. You really no. don't. You have to you have to really. Nobody says you have to have a 2021. Right. Whatever That's, bass boat yeah. that you're running. You can have I, I know guys that fish the opens that we, we work with that one of them's got a 94 stratus yeah held together with bubble gum and duct tape yeah but you know he's one of the best dang fishermen i know in our area and deserves that shot if you have the drive that's all you need you don't need you don't need the money the money will Mm. come eventually if you have the drive and if you have the if you're willing to you know there's if you have the passion like people are going to come out of the woodwork to help you I'm not mm-hmm. saying that it's a, like a legit sponsorship, but like I early on had some people that that really wanted to help me, you know, that they I'd let they'd let me stay at their house mm-hmm. or they'd let me borrow their boat uh, and, and things like that. You know, so you can get help along the way. But it's yes, it's a very expensive sport if you get if you want to get all the equipment and everything right off the bat. But as far as growing, like start out small. My first boat was a 1987 Tidecraft. It was a 17 foot uh, boat that that the transom had rod in it. The engine was just barely hanging on, and uh, I think it. I ended up selling it to a guy, and he sunk it in a canal in oh, Miami yeah. or something like later on. But uh, it was it was such a terrible boat but it was a means to get to the next level yeah. uh, the next boat it's all about passion if you got passion for it and you work for it and you're and don't ever uh, like one thing that drives me crazy and we were getting on this is like people taking the easy way out by saying oh well it's you know it's a rich man's sport like obviously he's doing well he doesn't have to worry about money <laughs> what that's such a terrible mindset and mm-hmm. i've you know, I've, I've made comments like that and I have to step back and just be like, no, he's working his butt off. Yeah. That factor isn't that big of a factor, but he might be dealing with some personal stuff at home that I have 
never experienced. Yep. You know, he's got other variables that are, are tough. Card debt looks it's like, like you know, yeah, exactly. Know. So it's it's like that is a cop out. The second you try to to uh, uh, negate what somebody's accomplished because you think that they've got an advantage over you, they've got you're you're taking your advantage away by by saying that like you're you're copping out and Mm -hmm. that mindset is not the winning mindset at all and there's too much of that going on so don't ever like say wow this sport is just you know full of you know people that can afford it and that sort of thing you know that's just the wrong way to go about it one day you'll be one of those guys that can afford to do the tour level and to have a new boat every year and and things like that but it's it's a stair-step process yep and one thing i want to ask you is like you know, one of the frustrating things for me also is, is, um, and when I was, you know, going, living in that travel trailer and, and literally just thinking about fishing nonstop, uh, I would see other guys make it to the top so much quicker, but now, and I, and it would, it would bother me, which is unfortunate because I'm like, I'm working so hard here. I'm giving up everything. I'm sacrificing so much. I'm in this stupid trailer <laughs> and it, it, and it's like, I'm, I'm doing everything right. Why is it not happening? And, uh, it, it one thing I've, I've definitely learned is that everybody's got a different path. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, have you seen the same thing? I mean, so it depends on the person you, you know, you watch certain guys that, that do rise to the top quick, right. But they all have their story too. Right. Um, yeah. You know, some, I would say, you know, have a means right. already. Right. Um, but how did they get the means? Right. You know, a lot of them, people don't know how they got the means. Right. So for instance, you've got certain guys that let's say, they worked their butt off right for 20 years fished their first open series because they wanted to and they made the elites their first try right you know and then they say well where'd this guy come from he must have you know whatever right but then you've got a you know you get a guy like brian new yeah. perfect example of something like that hard-working guy yeah. goes out fishes the opens a couple years and makes it a couple times in or whatnot but and then goes out his first elite series yeah. event and wins and he's not the youngest angler to no. win and he's one of the nicest guys you'd ever talk to right and you know he had no uh, hardly any sponsors going into it right um and, he, and and the sponsors have come and and i don't know if he's even one that really wanted a lot of relationships and, th- and there's some guys that are going to be like that too right that have already figured out their finances and don't want outside help because they don't want to work a third or fourth or fifth job, which is, which is basically what you're doing. Every, every sponsor that you pick up, I don't think people realize is that that the big misconception that I always hear is, and the best way to say it is people think they should be paid for experience versus what they are being, uh, what they can offer. Right. So to me, I look at it as, you're being paid for a job. Right. Whereas some guys have it stuck in their head that I catch fish. I'm getting publicity for catching yeah. the fish. This is my experience deserves payment. Yeah. We're essentially media tools. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's all, all it is. We're, we're this isn't true sponsorship. This is not right. like, Oh, well, we're going to sponsor this angler and just put a logo on right. on the boat or something like that. That's true sponsorship where there's not a whole lot on the back end yep. that you have to do. Uh, fishing is not that way. Like the, and the, in some cases there, there, there are things like that. So are, non-endemics and yeah. stuff like that. A lot of times they're looking for brand recognition right. or write off. Those come when you're really big and yeah. when you got the, the real value, the real following. Yep. But uh, the, what most people consider sponsorships um, is really truly a job. Yeah. And if you don't treat it like a job, you're you're setting yourself up for failure. For sure. And you know, I've made the same mistakes. Um, but it's you know, you have to treat those companies as a, another job. And they want, you know, a company like you, you want to return. Mm-hmm. And and what I do for every single company that I, you know, I, I approach is okay, first off what are their needs? Like, what does their social media look like? Does it look like they need content, video content, photos, whatever it is, or maybe it's a blog for Mm -hmm. their lifestyle, you know, uh, 
blog series they've got. Uh, if they have a something that they need, you know, that I can provide, then I'll go after them. If it's something that is way out of like, if they need, uh, you know, a million impressions or, you know, whatever metric you're using um, uh, for just a logo presence on their boat, because there's, you know, they're looking for the biggest name, you know, that may be not be me yet, you yeah. know, and so you've got to look at it from that point of view is like, you know, well, a, and a, not an every, every deal is going to be a cookie cutter deal either. All, none of mine are cookie cutter. Yeah, yeah, it's catered to what they need and what you're able to help help yeah. with. And I mean, there's certain situations where I look at it and there's things that I can offer people, you know, and here, here would be a creative one for somebody that is actually up and coming, looking to like pay for their BFL, something like right. that. Why don't you work? Let's say you're a landscaper right? or you're somebody that is able to landscape. Um, and you know, somebody that owns a company, go cut their yard at their business right. for a year yeah. and agree to X amount of, you know, entry fees for that right. year. And that's almost like gaining a client, right? Because you're, you've got, they've got a guaranteed lawn guy, right? And you've got a guaranteed sponsor to pay for it. And you've got to cut one extra lawn per week. Yeah. That's a, that's a, the kind of create creative, you know, deal that you need to put together. And guess what? That guy doesn't care how big his logo is on your boat because he's getting a, a free cut or he's getting right. a cut every week because well, that's what he's paying for. The byproduct is you can use it for fishing now. And, and another example would be like, say a car dealership, mm -hmm. right? All right. It's not going to mean much to them if they just put their logo on, on a boat. That's that may not generate the traffic that, that they need. They mm -hmm. need foot traffic into that, that dealership. And, and also they need an ability to be able to, to maintain the, 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 uh, uh, the customers that they have. Right. So like, you know, offering, uh, some VIP trips or some, some guide trips to their VIPs, you know, adding a hospitality package, approaching it from that, that point of view, those, all those sort of things really work, but really you got to figure out where that void is. And if you can fill it, if you can fill that void, and, and, uh, and, and it's the, the price tag is worth your, your effort and you truly can, can deliver what you promise. It's a great deal. You know, yeah. that's a really good deal and you won't burn a bridge that way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we've always gone with, you know, try to, you know, under promise over deliver kind of deal. Yeah. And you'll, you'll never have to worry about, you know, justifying your position. It, Exactly. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And it, kind of going back to like, you know, just starting out with the networking and then going to sponsorship later on. I mean, that's it. when I say, you know, it's really hard to scale a, a deal in the very beginning. It really truly is like mm -hmm. going from a discount to a paid position later on down the line is extremely difficult. Yep. And a lot of things change in between, you know, that, that, that jump. So it really, it's it, it really the best thing you can do is just, you know, uh, when an opportunity arises, jump all over it if it's right. But if it's if it's just, you know, if it's just getting a discount or, or just getting this, you know, maybe just, you know, uh, build a relationship with that company. And when the, when you're ready and they're ready, it'll be a really, really solid deal. And uh, and the last step is just to to actually do what you say you're going to do. Right. If you can do that, like you said, I mean, that, that is the, the, the way to a healthy business relationship. Yep. So you, you were one of the pioneers, uh, one of the top <laughs> 10 people I'd say that made the first jump to running three sets of electronics. Yeah. I thought I was the first, but I, I guess there's a few guys uh, there. Were, it, yeah, I think you were pretty much the There's first some but closet guys. Right. That were right. Yeah. Um, but you know, to to you kind of carved that part out and came up with a a unique situation mm -hmm. um with Bass Boat Electronics. Yeah, I can't take that much credit. I I was very fortunate to um to to meet get I Jason Cassell with with uh bassboatelectronics.com, he reached out to me and he had a need. Mm -hmm. for content and getting his brand out there. Yep. And so I was very fortunate because it was at a time where I didn't have a electronics partnership. I was just going to buy it, 
you know, straight up, you know, buy electronics, you know, retail. Um, again, that goes back to like, if, if I don't want to, I don't want to get into a partnership with somebody if I'm not going to be able to deliver. So mm -hmm. I just was going to buy retail and then Jason came along and it's been a great partnership. It's yep. been awesome. And he pretty much designed that, that whole system right. that I've got. Yeah. Um, so where do you see that going for the next couple of years? It looks like it's getting, I think that's going to be the new norm. It's going to be really. very hard for people to get locked down to one company. It seems like it's, it's going to be nearly impossible because each brand brings something to the table. There's, uh, there's no they, one. It, everything's advancing so much. So to, right now, you know, of course, Garmin brought the for, forward facing sonar and yep. pan optics live scope to the forefront. And then everybody's following suit with that. The next thing is who knows who's going to come out with that. You know, Humminbird still has 360, yep. um, which is, you know, the they've got a, a cat, you know, a, a monopoly on that technology. And, uh, and so for me, it's a smart thing to do. It really is. I just happen to get lucky enough to have a partner that, that doesn't have, there is no, sorry, I didn't mean to hit your, <laughs> your, but, uh, he doesn't have like a allegiance to one brand. So, right. well, and that gets back to what you were talking about, about don't ask for the, you know, the discounts just to get the discounts right? and, you know, buy retail, do whatever you need. It's the same thing. You didn't lock yourself down yeah. with one company. Yeah. to to do what you're trying to do you're you've decided i'm not going to lock myself into and wish i had something else why not run everything that's going to make me a better angler right buying buying a stuff is really expensive yeah especially electronics i get it me saying you know it's easy for me to say because i've got a great partnership but i literally bought my own electronics for for a long time you know so and it helped me leave that category open Yep. You see, if I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a great relationship or a great deal before. And if I just simply, you know, took a discount with a brand, uh, You'd I would, I would have been precluded out of that deal with, with basketball electronics. Right. That's what I'm trying to say is like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to scale that deal with that, yeah. that electronics company, not fast enough. Um, but basketball electronics had something they wanted to accomplish and we've done it you know they've yeah. grown they've grown a lot um jason has done nothing but provide for me as far as uh you know the electronics on the boat and just being a resource for me so i couldn't be happier it with also that. helps that they're not far from you either yeah that doesn't <laughs> yeah i actually every time we rig a new boat i go up there and i bring the camper and i just sleep in the parking lot because <laughs> it, it, for for us to get it right and when i say us i mean jason with me breathing over his shoulder uh, I, I have to, you know, give it a little bit of time. He's, he does a phenomenal job, but he's very, very thorough. Um, but yeah, man, it's, uh, that deal with three brands of electronics, it doesn't need to be three, but pick right. two. I think if you pick two different brands yeah. that each one's going to bring something new to the table. And, uh, I like having those secondary systems that aren't interconnected constantly yeah. like on my boat right now i've got two hummingbird heel or a uh, uh, solix units gen threes that are connected um and then i've got two Lawrence hds lives that are connected but then i have a garmin that's by itself yeah so if one of those systems you know starts glitching out which a lot of times they'll go in pairs and they'll glitch out i've got another one you know at the console and then at the bow i've got three so right yeah. It's always good to have backups <laughs> for backups. I'm a big, you know, backup and spare part guy. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier with the, yeah. uh, you know, the the safety plans. The and before we got on here, we were talking about uh, bilge pump and yeah. you know, spare all the spare things that you may need mm. that could go wrong. <laughs> I know I've I've traveled with a spare trolling motor and you know all that kind of stuff because yeah, that's one thing you don't want to get caught without. You know, I if I'm going to a, a tournament that doesn't have a, you wouldn't find me at a tournament without a spare prop, a spare troll motor. Um, I I've even brought two spare troll motors if I'm going on the road for, for several, several weeks mm -hmm. or, or, you know, month or more. Well, it's not even failure that you're worried about all the time. It's, no, you know, it's, you can run it, you can be going into a lock and bust it off. Yeah. 90% are or, is self-inflicted yeah, damage. You know, 90% yeah. of the things that I have to repair or, or replace is because of, 
you know, me making a mistake or something happening on the water that is not the manufacturer's issue. Yep. So uh, it being prepared is just super important, man. That, you know, just every single time something does go wrong, just keep in your memory banks and keep a spare part with you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, trailer hubs. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've gone through a bunch of uh, trailer hub caps. You know, I've gone through a bunch of those. I carry a grease gun with me. Was it, I, was it Sam Rayburn? That was the night nightmare tournament. Oh, that was a bad one. So, uh, Cause bad. I remember uh, w- that was right when our store flooded yeah. And I hadn't <laughs> talked to you through all of that because we were going crazy here, whatever. Yeah. And after Sam Rayburn, you pulled out a check at Sam Rayburn. Um, good finish. It was like yeah. 18th. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I called you. I was like, man, good job, whatever. And you're like, I'm just happy I made it out alive. Oh, yeah. That was, you talk about a tough, a tough event. A t- just everything that went wrong, could go wrong, went wrong. It started off, you know, of course my mom passed away that, right. that fall and that was really tough. And I just got back to California from her, you know, mm-hmm. from the funeral. So I was emotionally exhausted at that point. And then I came back, I did a, a show, f- um, uh, with a sponsor. Um, and then uh, on the way back from that, it was at Nashville on the way back, my dad, called me and, and I had to, he had his own health issues and I had to go. Um, and instead of having two weeks to pack and get ready for the season, uh, I had a day and a half cause I needed to come down to Florida and, uh, and help him out with that. And everything worked out just fine. We had, you know, and so everything's good there, but, um, I, I packed everything in a day and a half, the camper, the truck, the boat, everything trucked it down didn't even have any hours on the boat at all. And then ended up, um, you know, once I, everything was okay on his end, I knew that I, I, I wasn't even sure if I'd make the first event, to mm-hmm. be honest with you, family first. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, once everything was good, I ran over to, to, to Sam Raber and had to break in the engine there, uh, ended up, uh, losing all of my packages that I had <laughs> sent there. So I had uh, like thousands of dollars worth of sponsor packages that were sent there and they ended up getting lost. I never got them until the end of the event. Ended up crashing my drone. I was doing some social media footage and I crashed my drone and it sank into Sam Rayburn. Uh, ended up having some some mechanical issues, had to get some, some stuff replaced and uh, even hit a railroad track going, going from, from one spot to a next. Uh, I was actually going from Sam Rayburn to test out my equipment on, on Toledo bend. And I hit a railroad track that didn't, wasn't marked or anything. And it ripped off the spare tire cradle. Oh man! The, all the batteries jumped out of their, you know, their, uh, their trays and all that. And then I ended up hitting a tree during the tournament, the first day of the tournament, you know, and had, this to, is all stuff you can't make yeah, up. Either. Yeah. I had, <laughs> so, so aside from, you know, mechanical issues, I had a self-inflicted one where I hit a under, you know, submerged tree and, uh, which I'd never done before. And then, uh, ended up having to borrow a boat and I, I didn't know until eight o'clock I couldn't find any boat. And, and finally I, somebody was, uh, Chris Brazier that fishes the tour as well. He was, he was very gracious enough to, to let me borrow his boat, but I had to drive three hours, you know, in the middle of the night up and then back and then got in the, the water. And of course it had just been sitting in, in the yard for a while. Cause it was his last mm-hmm. year boat and, uh, the batteries weren't working. Uh, so couldn't, couldn't take off anywhere. I just had to troll and motor around, but anyways, I don't want to drag on the story. A lot more happened, but ended up, you know, persevering through that yep. and, uh, and without any sleep, anything like that had a lot of other stuff happen, but it ended up working out, you know, it's just all about, and it had a lot to do with the support system that I had as far as the service trailer guys too, yeah. you know, helping me out throughout that, that whole ordeal. But, um, it was a crazy week and, and, but those weeks are like the most valuable, yeah. you know, when you, when you can learn that you can go through something like that. And we only went through a, half of what happened in that event it was crazy how many things compiled on top of each other uh, at that tournament but for me to make it out with a, a good mindset um and a, a good finish like i knew i could make it through any tournament after that yeah yeah so it was actually pretty good but <laughs> but it was awful <laughs> it was it was absolutely just gut-wrenching terrible 
everything that was happening during that. It was like, I, 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 if I was going to quit, is, I remember calling you thinking I was giving you the worst news possible. <sighs> and then you, you tell me all of that. I'm like, man, my stuff's not so bad. <laughs> we were just been closed for two and a half months. <laughs> it was so, it was so crazy. It was awesome. But big shout out to Chris for, for letting me borrow his boat. Like seriously, I, even though I couldn't get, you know, go anywhere, but fish right there by the ramp. Um, it, I obviously did well enough there at the ramp. I actually caught my biggest bag bags of the event there. Um, and I couldn't have done it without him, you yeah. know? And, uh, so yeah, that was very nice of him to do that. So I think, um, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, where do you see yourself going, going for 2022? Well, I, I mean, I'm happy. It's, it's always kind of like, you never know where miles is going, what he's doing. And, you know, I don't know, man. I, I, all I know is that I'm going to put more focus as I have recently on YouTube and really do more on YouTube. I really get a lot of satisfaction out of interacting with people on YouTube and getting, you know, feedback and, and things like that. And I really do enjoy teaching people. So I'm going to do that a lot more. Um, you know, and I've already been doing a lot more of that. Uh, so YouTube's going to be a big push. Um, other than that, I mean, fishing the pro circuit, I'm really super happy where I'm at. Uh, I, I love the, the organization and, and love, you know, just fishing at that level. So, you know, I'm going to stick with that. I'm mm -hmm. definitely going to fit in as many like Toyota series and, and maybe some opens as I possibly can, but uh, it's going to be the same old, same old, but I'll tell you what, one big thing that we've got going on is we bought a, a piece of property in, in Dayton. We got 17 acres. And yep. so I'm going to be building that, um, that, uh, you know, homestead quite a bit in the, the next year or two. So that's really exciting. And that's probably the biggest, you know, development we've got going on. Right. Yeah. Do you, um, if you were ever to qualify for the BPT and get mm -hmm. called up, would you take it for sure? Yeah, for sure. After fishing the, the yeah, one event, I would want to do both of them. Yeah. yeah I wouldn't want to do both of them. Right. I fished two uh, different, uh, BPT style formats. Uh, one was the title last year. And then, and then of course the one at Travis this year. And I really enjoyed myself. You were the King of Guadalupe bass. Oh down yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, no, nobody else was really catching them. And the, uh, I, the, I they actually to, had like a whole thing on the live segment. Um, deciphering what it was because you called it a guadalupe bass everybody that was at uh doing the commentary had no clue what you were talking about at that moment and they literally had to call a biologist in for you're a, kidding no i'm not joking are you serious they yeah, didn't they, they 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 weren't quite sure exactly what it, what you were talking it was either about. a guadalupe they, or it was a rock bass well no, i know no, it was no, a guadalupe. yeah no they they were um that was really cool by the way. that they uh they were not a hundred percent sure that you were joking or not about it um, on, on the, on the live commentary. And, right. and they actually phoned back and they said, well, we've just been on the phone with, you know, that is an so advisor. Cool. And, yeah. And that so, is so yeah. cool. I didn't know that you were the, you were the first one to catch a Guadalupe bass on there. I caught, I, I weighed in too. And the thing, they're super rare to catch them. Yeah. And like they were saying yours size. were like good size. Yeah. Ones like too. a pound and a half. I couldn't believe like it. Like the record like, was like two or three pounds or something yeah, like that. It's, I think it's three pretty, pounds is the record. Yeah. So like catching a pound and a half or plus is it's like a five pounder. Anywhere yeah. Else. It's like a six or seven yeah. pound largemouth. Yeah. Yeah. It, that was pretty crazy, but I would absolutely move up to the BPT. I would want to fish the pro circuit as well, which is one of the, the benefits of being under that umbrella is mm -hmm. that, you know, I can fish the five fish limit tournaments as well as, you know, the BPT this year. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to make it this year. Um, but, uh, you know, all the other years, the last two years I've had, you know, close to top tens by the end of the season, as far as in points. Um, uh, and, uh, this year I, I'll, I won't make it. I wasn't nearly as consistent. I had one extra bad tournament, unfortunately, <laughs> But uh, absolutely. I mean, I plan on on qualifying for it very, very soon. And I'll definitely take take that invite because it is a lot of fun. They're really trying to do uh, great things over there. And uh, man, it's a super competitive. Yeah. From what format. I've heard, it's it's a very competitive format, very especially stressful. with the people that are in it, too. Yeah, I, I, I've never been spun out like I was during that event because I lost three three pounders in a row because of the zebra mussels. Mm -hmm. And uh Man, I, I barely recovered after that, you know, 
And uh, but it but that makes it fun. You know, yeah. that makes it interesting for for both the viewer and the the angler. So is it more stressful to hear the score tracker quiet or or lighten up? Oh, way way more when it's lighting up. But I, see, that didn't bother me. Like the mm-hmm. score tracker, I like the score tracker. It's just if you lose fish and you know how much that affects you, that's when I start going into a downward spiral. Like, you know, <laughs> that's when it starts getting real. But otherwise, it motivates me. Like right. I, I'm, I'm excited to hear guys catching them because I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start catching them. I got to make this. Did this it play move. to the strategy at all? Um, like if you heard certain names uh, catching them to kind of key in some extras when you weren't catching them. You know, you try to do that. Like you think that that's the way to do it, but those guys, they're so versatile. You never know what they're doing. Right. Like I assumed one guy was doing uh, one thing because of, of what he's known for. And then I'd pass him, and he's out there in the middle of nowhere throwing a drop shot or something. So I couldn't, I couldn't anticipate that at all. Um, and we're not allowed to share information, yeah. you know? So I, I didn't really pay attention to that as much. Um, what I did pay attention to is when, when things started to really pick up at certain times during the day, so you could get your timing right. Yeah. Because if you, if everybody started catching them at the same time, you know that that is the timing, and you need to to approach you know your best spot during that that window. But that's the only thing. Otherwise, the the score tracker just motivates me. And you I, get guaranteed sandwich breaks. Garrett, I didn't get a sandwich break. I had to. <laughs> I had to retie and yeah i i mean that that 15 minutes goes by so quick yeah only time i got a sandwich break was when i was like in transit in between spots i had to set the the boat down and we just sat there and i had to you know i finally got to eat a sandwich but other than that man it is yeah a serious just marathon from start to finish yeah yeah well i appreciate you coming by and uh hanging out with us today it's been awesome you know this is exactly what i thought we would we would see um it's always really exciting to hear what what everybody's got to say um so where can everybody find you on social media yeah so uh the my social media tags are generally you know related to to miles bergoff or miles sonar bergoff so facebook it's miles sonar bergoff um and then sonar fishing and on instagram and youtube so those are the places you can find me of course you can also watch sweetwater um the best route to to go watch sweetwaters on waypointtv.com yep you can watch that all streaming there um and uh yeah that's that's pretty much it okay we we want to thank you for coming on today thank you and as always uh chris kingry and uh you can find me on all of my social channels whether it's facebook instagram tiktok uh it's chris kingry fishing also uh everything about my store at 44 tackle.com uh as well on youtube chris kingry fishing as well um and you know we're going to be uploading these uh you know bi-weekly and uh we're looking forward to having a lot of other guests on as well um and providing the you know the the how-to or the uh how i got their story so we want to thank everybody and make sure to hit the subscribe button on any of the uh, channels you're watching on and make sure to subscribe subscribe on itunes and spotify as well thanks again guys and uh, this has been the people of fishing podcast and thank you miles for coming out again Thanks for having me, man. It's an honor.